Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, everyone is welcome again to another edition of a seminar under the, the auspices of the Institute of African Studies seminar series. Institute of African Studies, <clears throat> by the way, is here at the University of Ghana in Legon. So we have uh, the special privilege of hosting Professor Emeritus uh, Jeffrey Hens uh, this afternoon, maybe this morning in some places or this <laughs> night somewhere else in the world. Uh, but we are very excited to uh, take this um, uh, lecture from Professor Emeritus um, uh, Jeffrey Hens. Uh, but to assist with the proceedings is uh, Dr. Njiba Frehiwat, uh, who is a, um, a friend and colleague, um, uh, a member of the history and politics section uh, of the Institute of African Studies. Uh, Professor, uh, uh, Dr. <laughs> maybe I should say Professor Njiba Frehiwat <laughs> is eminently uh, uh, qualified and is a very good position to uh, chair this event, given uh, the stream of uh, her research and work uh, over the years. Uh, Dr. Frehiwat. Dr. Imba, thank you very much. First of all, for the record, my name is Dr. Mjiba Frehiwat. I don't want any parts of that. I don't want any problems, please. This is for anyone who hears it on YouTube after this. <laughs> I'm so grateful, Dr. Imba, for the ability to uh, moderate this panel. I'm sure that there are other colleagues that are more positioned or positioned better to engage this conversation, but I'm happy to facilitate this conversation. So today we're here to listen to a, a discussion or a presentation titled Revolutionary Pop Populism and Democracy in Ghana. I'm gonna tell you about the abstract and then I'll tell you who's gonna present. The paper examines two decades of Jerry Rollins' rule in Ghana. It speaks, it seeks to explain why Rawlings revolutionary populism did not develop in the direction that he envisioned. He envisioned a new kind of popular democracy. Instead, Rawlings oversaw the reintroduction of Ghana's popularly, popularly preferred political systems, Western style multi-party democracy, despite his avowed intention of not doing so. To what extent was this outcome surprising or puzzling? The paper explains that it was neither surprising nor public or nor puzzling. As Rowling, as Rowling, as the Rawlings regime, the PNDC lacked the capacity to introduce a radical new political system, despite his desire to do so. His aim to craft a new kind of popular democracy was not achievable as both in internal and external opposition forces were stronger in their desire for multi-party <laughs> democracy and a neoliberal economic system. So we know that this is gonna be a very interesting and engaging um, presentation. The presentation is, is coming from Professor Emeritus Jeffrey Haynes. Jeffrey Hay Prof is uh, an emeritus professor in London, Metropolitan University, UK. He completed a PhD in 1988 entitled Rawlings and the Politics of Development Policy in Ghana, 1979 to 1986. He is the author or editor of more than 50 books. His forthcoming book, Revolution and Democracy in Ghana, The Politics of Jerry Rollins, will be published in early 2023 by Rutledge UK in their Africa Politics series. Prof, the floor is yours. You have 30 to 45 minutes to present, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Okay. Well, welcome to the Institute of African Studies seminar series. Thank you very much. I was, I was at the Institute... Just, just a couple of weeks ago, actually, I got back from Ghana last week, so it's very nice to uh, to re-engage with colleagues in Ghana and, and from elsewhere, of course. Um, the, the paper is um, a, a brief summary of a paper which will be published in the Journal of Modern African Studies this December, December 2022. It's a 12,000-word piece, so this is just really some cherry-picking some bits from that. The the paper and the book that um, the, the chair mentioned will develop the PhD, which was written a long, long time ago, but it was um, Jerry Rawlings passing in November 2020, which stimulated me to try and bring the story up to date. Um, the, the contribution of Rawlings to Ghana's political development, I think is probably not as 
as examined as it might have been so far. There seems to have been a lot of controversy about him, but not much in the way of political science examination of his of his approach to politics, his achievements, his lack of achievement. So this this paper really is a is a, is an early attempt to look at the basically the first 10 years of the PNDC regime when Rawlings, I think, tried to establish a regime built on revolutionary populism, which I shall try and explain in the presentation was not very well expressed or clearly expressed, but it carried a kind of an ideological fervor for a while, which enabled Rawlings to become a, a leading figure in Ghana's politics for, for some considerable years. I mean, he was, as you as you well know, of course, a a leading figure in the country in many ways for, for several decades. So this is trying to look at the ideological foundations of his regime in the 1980s especially and to identify what he sought to do but failed to do which was to bring about a new form of democracy in Ghana so let me let me go to the slides um, the by the way I sent the slides to the chair and to the facilitator of the seminar so if anybody wants the slides either ask me or ask ask one of them and um, we'll be happy to, to give them to you okay so so the paper examines two decades of Rawlings rule and seeks to explain why Rawlings revolutionary populism did not develop a new kind of popular democracy or what he referred to it as true democracy whatever that means he he, he used various terms but true democracy was the one he started with and I was never <laughs> never clear what he meant by true democracy. And then eventually, as, as you will know, after a decade of the PNDC trying to extricate himself from that impasse of a transitional regime which, which, which couldn't legitimise itself, um, Ghana reintroduced what I'm calling here Western style multi-party democracy, despite Rawlings very um, frequently expressed concern that, that 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 system doesn't work in Ghana for various reasons. So he spent a decade trying to make a revolution. He failed to do that. He eventually oversaw the return of conventional democracy. And I want to look at what the, the notion of revolutionary populism in Ghana meant for Rawlings perhaps, but also meant for the people of Ghana who obviously experienced 10 years of his um, provisional rule in the PNDC. Okay, well, you will know, of course, that the word populism is a very, very current one. Everyone's a populist these days, it seems, whether in Europe, uh, Donald Trump in America, uh, African leaders, leaders in Asia, Latin America, and so on. Populism is very much in vogue in terms of a political style. I, I would hesitate to say that populism is an ideology, but I would say it's a style and a method of, of, of ruling. It doesn't have to be right wing, doesn't have to be left wing, doesn't have to be authoritarian, doesn't have to be democratic, but populism for me means an attempt directly to communicate with the people, to identify the, the, the mass of ordinary people as the constituency with a populist leader seeking to establish his or her leading role in a political system which benefits the people. When we turn to revolutionary populism, this is an attempt to identify Rawlings' brand of populism as a, a form of revolutionary protest or revolutionary movement, an attempt to move from one status quo to a new and ideally better status quo, to craft a new kind of popular democracy based on grassroots participation, based on the idea that ordinary people should be a fundamental part of governance. But as we all know, as, as, as has been explained many times, the regime 
struggled to implement that vision into a workable system. I'm suggesting that the PNDC lacked the capacity to develop a workable radical new political system despite Rawlings' revolutionary intentions. And I think over time, both internal and external opposition forces were stronger. They gained in confidence. The external opposition forces were largely Western governments who put in place, and, and the IMF and World Bank, put in place conditionalities about loans, which were very heavily um, in support of a conventional democracy rather than a radical form of uh, democracy. Internally, of course, the, the Ghana opposition was cowed for some years, but did eventually manage to get its act together in the late 80s and um, was successful in, in encouraging Rawlings and the PNDC to basically return to the past, to bring into place the very system which he'd overthrown in 1981, a multi-party democratic system about which he was very skeptical. As you, as you will know. The, um, what the paper is trying to do really is to establish this, this period, this revolutionary period in a wider political context in Ghana and to seek to assess what, what were the aims and objectives of Rawlings during the eighties and what were the problems of him trying to achieve those aims and objectives. A starting point, obviously, is if, if someone takes power by coup d'etat, then their legitimacy is always going to be difficult to achieve. And it's probably true to say that Rawlings never managed to gain um, the, the necessary legitimacy amongst Ghanaians to be seen as, a, as, as someone who was a credible leader to take the country forward in the long term. Although, of course, he was elected president twice in the 90s. So it's, it's broadly to examine the relationship of Rawlings and democracy in Ghana at the time. Um, I, I'm not seeking to explain or examine the whole two decades, but to focus on the revolutionary phase, the 1980s, um, which, as I've already mentioned, came to an end in the early 1990s with a democratic turn back to the future uh, to a multi-party democratic system. He, he wanted to, he claimed to want to develop a new democratic revolution based on a populist understanding of, of, of Ghana, which basically said that those in power, whether the military or, or civilian regimes, were in it for themselves. They were, they were corrupt, they were ruling for themselves, and they were not concerned with the common people. And of course, in the 1970s, following the a Champong and a Kufa regime, Ghana was on a, a downward spiral to penury, to a to a what we now might call a failed state, in which the capacity for for progress was extremely limited. So when when Rawlings grabbed power, um, first of all in 1979, of course, and then in December 1981. He was confronting a situation of um, what one might call extreme turmoil. And what he aimed to do was to stabilize the situation, of course, and then to develop a new form of democracy, not based on the old multi party system uh, be bequeathed by the British in 1957, but a new populist form of democracy which would if you like bring government to the people and people to the government rather than being top down from the castle in a crowd but he but he but he didn't manage to do it and the question is why um, and i think this is highly important for politics in ghana today because although rollins is, is has now passed um the the two parties which emerged from the PNDC period, the NPP and the NDC, are still slugging it out for power periodically, alternating in power periodically, yet without, it seems, the capacity to take the country forward in a way in which the majority of Ghanaians feel is a, 
is a is a, is a good way forward. Um, so revolutionary populism and multi-party democracy, they're almost two, two extremes of a, of a democratic spectrum, possibly. So the paper examines the relationship between revolutionary populism and the, and the multi-party democratic arrangement, which emerged under Rawlings' leaderships. And the question is, did, did his revolutionary populism prepare the ground for the reintroduction of democratic civilian rule in Ghana in the early 90s? Well, yes, in, in a sense, because he, he enabled the referendum, which saw 92% of people saying they wanted multi-party democracy. He stood down without too much of a fight. He um, took part in democratic elections in 92 and 96, won them both times, although in 1992, of course, the, um, there was a controversy about whether it was free and fair. And it's often said, of course, that the the basis of, of his NDC party were the, were the defence committees slash committees for the defence of, of the revolution, whose activists largely formed the, the foot soldiers of the, of the new party. So I, I'm suggesting there was, a, there was a palpable link between the defence committees and the committees for the defence of the revolution and the NDC. And it would, it would still be the case, I think, to some degree that the, the former cadres of the, of the DCs and the CDRs would still be people, maybe their, their children, would now be staunch NDC supporters for the most part. That, of course, remains to be tested. I haven't done the research to, to make that point definitively, but that's my, my, my hypothesis. And of course, while Rawlings was fueling the birth of a new party, the, ND, the, the, the um, ND, NDC, the opposition, the NPP, was coalescing into a formidable political opposition. And once again, there's, there's, there's almost a return to the past here with the NPP, um, the Busia Dankwa um, Heritage Party, the NDC, of course, was not the Nkrumahist party, but there were elements of, a, of the Nkrumah's leftist populist appeal in the NDC. But it wouldn't be the case that the, uh, the NDC simply adopted Nkrumah's mantle. So in a way, there was a new form of political grouping emerging under Rawlings with the NDC in the early 90s, which built on the revolutionary populist phase, and especially the defense committees and the CDRs. Um, and it's, and, and Ghana is significant in another way under Rawlings, because as you will know, very few countries in contemporary Sub-Saharan Africa are what you might call um, liberal democracies. I think Freedom House, the American NGO lists eight countries currently out of the 54, which it classifies as free, which is a synonym, synonym for liberal democracies. Half of those are small island states off mainland Africa. The only other three um, uh, free countries by Freedom House's definition in Africa are Botswana, Namibia and South Africa. So Ghana is very unusual in, the, in that it managed to develop a viable multi-party system, especially from the foundations which led to its creation, Rawlings' authoritarian rule. So it's a reminder that so-called undemocratic regimes can initiate democratic experiments. And Ghana is a good example of how Africa's re-democratization started, which was not simply at the behest of Rawlings, of course, but linked to encouragement from outside and internal forces. And as you will know, there has been a recent turn away from democracy in Africa and other parts of the world. So Ghana's continuation of a democratic system, flawed though it is in many people's eyes, is a major achievement from a, from a, from a political science point of view in the context where democratic viability is looking increasingly under pressure in many parts of the world. And 
all being well, in January 2023, the country will celebrate 30 years of multi-party democracy, which will be the longest period of civilian rule since Ghana's founding in 1957. And I'm suggesting that some credit for this must go to Rawlings. Um, not all, by any means, but some. Okay, well, it's maybe worth just reminding us ourselves that revolutionary populist regimes were fairly common in Africa in the 80s. Um, there was, of course, Thomas Sankara's regime in Burkina Faso. There was uh, Yoevri Museveni's regime in Uganda. By some estimations, Samuel Doe in Liberia sought to be a revolutionary populist regime. So there was a, a handful of, of, of governments, often led by fairly young uh, junior military um, figures who were coincidentally perhaps um, embittered by the political status quo and believed that they could take their countries in directions which were more compatible with progress. And Ghana is the only one of those countries which managed to develop a democratic system from those revolutionary populist foundations. Um, so countries that tried revolutionary populism in Africa experienced different forms of political mobilization, but only in Ghana did a robust multi-party democracy consolidate. And I think the Rawlings era is an illustration both of the uniqueness of individual African countries' political experiences and of the collective vulnerability to global factors. The, the encouragement of Rawlings to democratize was strongly from outside. And this is a more general factor when it comes to political development in Africa, that the, the, the general dependence on Western sources of finance makes countries vulnerable to external pressure, not just to drive their economies in certain directions, but certainly back in the 90s and until fairly recently, to couple that with democratic political systems as an ideological process, which Western governments um, believe were necessary for progress. So in Ghana, the, the hegemonic impacts of both neoliberalism, multi-party democracy, molded what was possible economically and politically. So it's a way of saying that decision-making isn't done just by the agents in charge of those decisions, but they are also affected, affected by structural factors which limits the possibilities of what they can achieve. And that I think is, is clearly the case when it comes to, to Jerry Rawlings in Ghana. Well, the, I, was in, I was in Ghana until last week and I, I, I did a fair number of interviews and what, what struck me was the, um, the polarization of how Rawlings is perceived today. Um, and I say polarization because there was a bit of Definite, uh, definitely two ways of seeing him. Some see him as a reprehensible military dictator who presided over a lengthy period of political oppression, uh, disappearances and executions, some say 300 executions, incarceration of opposition figures, significant media repression, and what eventually became notoriously known as, a, as the culture of silence. Um, a context where Ghanaians were frightened to criticize the regime openly for fear of the consequences. Now, others regard Rawlings as, a, as an out-and-out -out national hero, second only perhaps to Nkrumah, uh, Junior Jesus, Papa Jerry, who saved the country from ruin, enabled Ghana's democratization and set the scene for sustained economic development. I, it's, you know, these are almost incompatible viewpoints. One, one excludes the other. If you believe that Jerry is a national hero, he isn't then also regarded as a reprehensible military dictator. So when we seek to assess the Rawlings period, for me, there's a great, great an issue about how to understand his legacy. And it's very difficult, I think, to come up with ways objectively to assess his 
his his legacy. And I, I don't want to say any more than that, really, other than to to say that one of the problems I have about understanding the period of PNDC rule and the figure of Rawlings more generally is these greatly differing opinions about how he should be perceived. Um, because the, even though we talk about the PNDC regime, clearly, to a significant extent, Rawlings was the PNDC regime. He had the, the individual power to um, make decisions which stuck. There was no, no, no sense of collective responsibility, I don't think, even when the PNDC initially formed in, in, in early 1982, um, when it was a combination of military and civilian figures. So vastly important, but how to separate out the man's individual legacy from the structural conditions which he also had to um, engage with is a difficult question i think okay so as as you know i mean this is old, old history you will know this of course but rawlings took power via a coup d'etat 31st december 1981 um as far as can be as far as we can tell the coup enjoyed broad support class-based division once again the poor dispossessed regarded him as a savior perhaps um wealthy and middle classes viewed him with suspicion and trepidation because he wanted to change things dramatically so rawlings emphatically appealed to the the poor the dispossessed the workers the those who he claimed had missed out because of the corruption of the elite. I mean, he was, as you know, explicit in, in, in calling out who he thought was to blame for Ghana's state of affairs, and explicit about calling out the reasons for why he thought it necessary to take power. Not like 1979 when it was three months, a house cleaning, leave, leave the state. This was an open-ended provisional regime which sought to make significant changes to Ghana's politics and economy. So I'm suggesting that he employed what I'm calling a, uh, I'm calling what he tried to lead a popular revolution via a populist approach. And um, although, as I mentioned earlier, populism is a very, you know, wide expression, very, very unclear what it means sometimes. I think it's fair to say that there are three characteristics of populism which Rawlings represented. First, the first one was to clearly express political and economic divisions between the people and their enemies. You know, this was a fundamental facet of Rawlings' approach. This, there's the people and there's the rest. The people were the ones who needed to rise up to take out the corrupt, to rule themselves in ways which would, would be beneficial collectively. He wanted to exemplify the revolutionaries' moral and pragmatic legitimacy as bona fide popular representatives. Now, of course, Gar Rawlings didn't come from a, a poor background. He didn't come from a, the background of workers or small farmers. He came back from a, he came from a fairly elite background, went to actually went to school. Uh, got a commission in the Air Force. He was not, uh, you know, an ordinary person, but he presented himself as one of Ghana's ordinary people, the toilers, the struggles, the strivers, who he would champion and represent. And he did this by focusing popular outrage against existing power holders and economic elites. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting that Rawlings created this, this, uh, concern with elites, but he built on people's existing concerns with how rotten the system was and exploited that for his own um, political goals. But you will know, of course, that in 1983, out of the blue, to the, to the outrage of the leftists in the PNDC, he went to the IMF. 
just as a Likud for the government's done last week, went to the IMF and the, the left, even to this day, claims that this was an utter betrayal of the revolution by Rawlings. It showed that he was uh, merely a right-wing conservative who would kowtow to neocolonialism, imperialism. But the other view, of course, is that Rawlings realized pragmatically that the only approach that Ghana could adopt that would be successful in extracting the country from the economic problems it, it, it was in was to get finance from where it, where it was offered. He didn't get any significant money from so-called progressive countries, including those in Eastern Europe, communist countries at the time. So pragmatically, Rawlings, I think, chose to go to the IMF, chose to adopt conditionality as the only feasible approach to trying to extract Ghana from its economic malaise. And uh, the, the, the Financial Times, William Wise, uh, a journalist on the Financial Times newspaper, says that Rawlings became a market realist, converted to the magic of the market to achieve Ghana's economic redemption. Well, I, I think that's overstating it. I think, for me, Rawlings was a pragmatist who took the least bad option. The other option, of course, was to depend upon autarky, upon Ghana's own efforts to, to use the expression, pull Ghana up by its boot, bootstraps, completely without foundation. It, it, it was an implausible approach, I think. So to build a revolution, he needed paradoxically to go to the very source of that country's impoverishment, the West. But I think I, I would see that as, a, as an asset of Rawlings, to be able to take difficult decisions in the interest of what he saw as Ghana's best interests. And of course, as you well know, I mean, uh, going, going to the IMF in July 2022 was the 18th time that Ghana's had to do this. So it's not as though Rawlings was somehow the only leader who felt that going to the IMF was the was the only viable approach, but he's vilified for this by the left because he's regarded as a traitor for doing that. Although I don't think there was a viable alternative. But despite this, he maintained his revolutionary populist approach, consistently employing anti-elitist appeals, seeking to mobilize a broad-based political coalition against corrupt elites, which he claimed were exploiting and despoiling Ghana. Um, once again, this, this comes down to this polarised view of him. Um, but he did consistently see Ghana's problems as largely moral problems of the behaviour, especially of those with power and money. If they were to behave properly, morally, with ethics, then Ghana would improve its position politically and economically. Now, I think that's naive, and I think that's not especially helpful to build a revolution, to have that approach, but it was one that he maintained consistently. And, um, you know, he, he continued with these populist appeals, vilifying the elite. But what he tended to do over time was to make the elite almost anybody who disagreed with him. And this was a, a kind of an authoritarian characteristic of his, of his um, character, which many have noted was, I guess, um, something which, which emerged and developed over time, a, a, an, an innate authoritarian side to him, which brooked no argument, which brooked no disagreement, which led him to believe that he was the only one who could take the country forward. Um, but he consistently expressed concern for the ordinary men and women in Ghana, and many ordinary men and women in Ghana consistently express um, uh, respect for, for, for Jerry Rawlings. Um, what did he mean by popular democracy? Well, I, you know, I, I, I've probably read nearly every word that he, he ever 
said in interviews or uh, in other contexts about his democratic uh, goals. And I've never become, never been clear as to what he meant. Um, there was always this vague, rather fuzzy allusion to popular power, true democracy, he called it, but it was, I think, a real fundamental flaw in his approach by lacking a clear ideological program to bring about the revolution politically. Because the, the attempt of the defense committees was pretty clear, almost straight away, was not going to work because of the hostility to many of the DC activists, both in the workplaces and in, in, the, in the neighborhood. Uh, it said that Rawlings looked admiring at Libya's system of people's democracy. And of course, back in the eighties, Libya was seen as a country that had developed a kind of a populist uh, democracy. We perhaps will be skeptical about that now, knowing what, what really occurred in Libya under, under Gaddafi. But, Rawlings called Libya a revolutionary dream. And Gaddafi, of course, was a consistent supporter of, of Jerry Rawlings. Um, according to Robert Fritz, who was US ambassador to Ghana, 1983 to 86. So he was there at, at, at the point when Rawlings was trying to institute these, um, this democratic revolution. Rawlings saw Libya and Cuba as models. And um, Rawlings was, according to Fritz, intrigued by radical revolutionary regimes in Africa and the world intrigued but not but not to have the capacity to develop a system either independently of Cuba and Libya or a system which actually drew on Cuba and Libya. Both of them of course had strong movements controlled by government. Cuba the Communist Party of course and in Libya a, a personalist um, set up under Gaddafi, but Rawlings didn't didn't do this. He didn't put himself up as the kind of the the dictator. I mean, there's no pictures of Jerry Rawlings on the walls in offices in Ghana. Even back then, in the 80s and 90s, there were no pictures of him on the walls. So he he didn't put himself forward as this kind of messiah figure who could take the country forward. Didn't develop a viable political structure based on popular power, but believe somehow that, that if Ghanaians behaved more morally, more ethically, that somehow there would be a magic resurgence of the country and a political revolution would spontaneously occur. And I, I think that was incredibly naive and incredibly problematic because no revolution is built like that. So Rawlings stayed close to Castro and Gaddafi. Um, Fritz says he developed kindred relationships with them. Um, for the West, Ghana's new, newly friendly relations with Libya confirmed suspicions that Gaddafi had played a direct role in the 31st December coup that overthrew President Hilal Leman. And Fritz notes the Western governments were concerned over an expanding wage of Russian, Chinese, Libyan, and Cuban influences and that Ghana could become a platform to destabilize West Africa. And this was one of the reasons, of course, why the IMF and Western bilateral donors were willing to work with Rawlings because they believed he could, they could sort of counter his radical and revolutionary approach, which linked up with the, some of the progressive countries in Eastern Europe and elsewhere. So I think there was a, there was a strong ideological um, purpose to the IMF World Bank agreeing on loans to Ghana. But the price was to undermine Rawlings's revolutionary links with radical countries in other parts of the world. Um, Please, Prof, you have about 10 minutes. Thank you, that's just perfect. Thank you very much. Great, you're welcome. Um, yeah, so what about the defense committees? Well, um, even now, it's quite hard to get a, get a handle on the defense committees. Once again, they're very polarizing things. Um, some people like Bafo Ajman Dua say they were like Maoist, um, revolutionary communist entities that, that 
unleashed a reign of terror. Um, others say that they were important grassroots organizations which did a lot of good and productive work in um, in the community. There seems to be examples of, 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 of both um, facets of the defense committees, but they were never broadly accepted by Ghanaians. And my, my sense is that many Ghanaians thought they were just vehicles for the have nots to try and grab things off those that had. And um, I don't think that's a fair assessment, but I think that's how many Ghanaians still perceive the defense committees. Um, there was, of course, a, a national defense committee which sought to guide the defense committees ideologically, but that never seemed to have any real impact. System of public tribunals to sort of bring lawmaking uh, down to the people and a network of people's shops. But these were, I think, either ineffective or they met with a lot of hostility from, from many ordinary um, Ghanaians. But the overall point was this was how to involve the people in governance. But this was very divisive because the, the people that got involved were often those that had been powerless before. And the middle classes, the wealthy, were much more, much less willing to take part. Um, just briefly, the defense committees were replaced in late 1984 by committees for the defense of the revolution because they'd failed. I mean, it was as simple as that. They just hadn't hadn't lived up to their to their potential. District assemblies followed the 1988-89, a, a kind of a further attempt to bring in a, a popular democracy via a no, no party arrangement. Multi-party democracy followed in 1992, following a referendum, overwhelming support for multi-party democracy. And, you know, Rawlings was persuaded to allow a return to multi-party democracy, despite his scepticism by his kitchen cabinet of close advisors. And um, it seems that Rawlings later on regretted that um, he'd been persuaded to, to stand down. Um, and certainly regretted later on to stand down after two terms as president without trying to alter the constitution to allow him to stay in power for longer. But he did stand down, he didn't alter the constitution, he departed. Um, he was still a young man when he departed, so he, I think, <laughs> felt he had unfinished business, which he, which, which um, encouraged him to be very outspoken in his critique of successive governments. But Williams was persuaded that the only way to allow the PNDC to exit the power, to, to exit power with a degree of legitimacy and dignity, was via a return to democracy, and it seemed like. 10 years, a full circle, from overthrowing a multi-party democracy to instituting one, with the 10 years of the PNDC, a kind of an interregnum, where there'd been attempts to, well, attempts, there'd been the desire to introduce popular democracy, which had not been fulfilled. So what were, we, what were his achievements, if any? Well, I'm quoting a US uh, professor, Beth Rabinovitz, who, who, who wrote the following in a 2018 book. Rowling successfully presided over a stable polity for two decades. He took over a state that all but collapsed, left one in its stead with real institutions and political stability. What is more, he left power willingly, setting the stage for Ghana's future democratic success. Overall, Rowling's success has to be understood as due to his leadership, and more specifically to his willingness to carry through the crucial resuscitation of his country's failed productive base by sacrificing his political capital in the urban areas. Now, I'm not saying whether that's, you know, I agree with that or not, but it seems to me a fair assessment, one assessment that one could make about the Rawlings period. To what extent were these outcomes linked to Rawlings' revolutionary populism? Um, well, I'd say there's a failure a failure of revolutionary populism in Ghana. Two main reasons for that. Um, two main reasons explain the failure to develop Rowling's albeit fuzzy goal of a new or true democracy via revolutionary populism. First, his understanding of Ghana's democratic needs was deficient. He didn't understand that 
his approach to democracy was not, not one which many people shared. And he could never seem to get his head around the fact that his approach was not widely adopted by many other Ghanaians, partly because they didn't understand what he was getting at. So he adhered to an unclear notion, radical, true, or popular democracy to be achieved via revolutionary populism. He seemed to believe that vague allusions to a radical form of popular democracy would win sufficient support for his revolution and diminish Ghanaian cynicism and demoralization caused by long-term political and economic disappointments. It didn't turn out to be the case. It took him 10 years to realize that. And even there, he never seemed to be fully, fully cognizant of the fact that his approach had, had failed. And finally, the second issue was that Rawlings considered, and he, this is a quote from a, a book by Barry Rubin, a US scholar in, from 1987, Rawlings considered that the greatest problem with governing countries in the third world is the apathy and ignorance of a greater part of the people. They must be taught to participate in the life of the state. So it's kind of an authoritarian, almost military approach that the people must do better to live up to the expectations of the leader. Well, if you adopt that approach, I think you're always going to struggle to build a system that you want because if you blame the people for the failures rather than yourself, then I think it's the, the wrong approach. He failed to build popular confidence by establishing appropriate political and economic structures, although he sought to lead by example. In other words, he lacked the capacity to develop authentic mechanisms by which citizens could feel they were making meaningful contributions to Ghana's political and economic development. And that, I think, was the reason why um, his revolutionary populist approach failed to deliver the new, the new or true democracy that he wished to see. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm sure we can. Um, it'd be good to hear them. So thank you. Thank you so much, Prof Haynes. I think that we will all agree that. Um, that this was a very interesting um, debate, uh, interesting presentation, and I'm looking forward to conversations, um, conversations and, and comments from the audience. We'll start off by taking three comments. Um, please raise your hand if you're interested in speaking, asking a question or making a comment, um, and then Prof, you can then go ahead and answer and we'll do this round. Okay. Um, until we have questions. Well, we're ending this session um, at about 1.30. Um, so we got about 30 minutes for, for an inter interaction. So the Thank first you. person I see is Gretchen Bauer. Please open your mic and go ahead and answer your ask your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I have uh, one quick comment and maybe a question. And the, first, and the comment is just to also take into account kind of the world and African context of the early 1990s, right? The late 1980s and the early 1990s, you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the disintegration of the Soviet Union, and across the African continent, these transitions were taking place, right, to, you know, a so-called multi-party democracy. And there was a feeling that, you know, this was the only game in town, right? That was a language that was often used. So that's my comment. And then my question is, and I really don't know very much about um, Rawlings and this era, but you know, typically when you have a revolutionary movement, you also have like a revolutionary program behind it, right? You have intellectuals, you have thinkers. You know, I understand that students, university students, were behind Rawlings, but was part of the problem also that you know you kept saying that he would reference a true democracy, but that there was no kind of sophisticated, you know, thoughtful ideological program behind what he was seeking to put into place. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for that comment. Prof, we'll take uh, two more comments. Uh, David, Ajiman, please, the floor is your, open, oh, yours. Open your mic and, and bring your question out and we'll have yes, one um, in the chat. Yes, Prof, thank, thanks so much for, for, for your work. And uh, it's very, very interesting and my, um, question is that um, will you say Rollins's um, appointees who were a combination of 
people from the CPP and the UP uh, uh, stock did not understand his model for development for Ghana. That is why he encountered a lot of problems. Um, when uh, he was um, a military leader, you know, transitioning to um, democracy, uh, multi-party democracy from 1992. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm grateful for that question. So we have T, -T, -T please. Please uh, bring your, open your mic and bring your question and then we'll bring the one question in from the, um, from the audience. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted to ask, um, you mentioned that there is a clear link between a populism and political violence, AKA politicide. Uh, how would you apply that link, um, populism to genocide, uh, specifically uh, Rwanda? Uh, thank you very much. Did you say in relation to R Rwanda? Yes, Rwanda or countries in Africa that have experienced our genocide, okay. for example, okay. Darfur. Thank you. And thank you very much for that question. Prof, we have one question in the chat. Aside from the factors you've clearly explained, do you think the polarized nature of post-independence Ghana emanating from the political traditions of Nkrumahism and Dankwa Busia, which had their own somewhat contradictory logic and ideologies and actually structured and political landscape may have had influence on Thartin in Thartin Thwarting the revolutionary populist path Rawlings wanted to wanted to introduce. Please, Prof, the floor is yours. For other colleagues and com, uh, colleagues on the, if you're interested in putting your ch question in the chat, we welcome. Um, we may be we'll be able to take another round after this response. Thank you. Thank you so much for the questions. Um, First question is the ideological program. Well, um, this is this is kind of a book length book length issue in itself. The uh, as you mentioned, um, Gretchen, the uh, the the idea ideology behind Jerry Rawlings was definitely on the left, and it seemed to comprise two sets of leftists. Um, both of whom might describe themselves as Marxists um, or socialists, with on the one hand you had what were primarily young men, few women, young men in their early, early to mid twenties, based at the University of Ghana Legon, um, who were either political science undergraduates or law undergraduates, and they they formed the Uniform Movement, which, as you will know, was the date in 1979 that Rawlings briefly took power in the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council. In addition to the JFM was the National Democratic Movement, which comprised largely older uh, professors at the University of Ghana, particularly in the law faculty. The NDM people believe the JFM people were naive, the JFM people believed the NDM people were too slow and hesitant. Both thought they could manipulate Rawlings in the way that they, in the ways that they believed was the way forward. It's commonly mentioned that Rawlings was not an ideological thinker, but it's also mentioned that he was not willing to, to, to take either approach of the NDM or JFM without questioning them. So, the problem of ideology was that the, the hot-headed radicals on the left wanted a revolution now. They wanted the Chinese-style communist revolution with a vanguard party, and the expectation was that the defense committees would be that vanguard party. Well, um, there'd been no groundwork, there'd been no consistent approach work to build such a party. So the ideology was sketchily there, but Rawlings didn't buy it. He was much more pragmatic and he regarded uh, the leftist approach of the JFM to be impractical. The NDM approach took precedence, but the NDM ideologues were much more pragmatic. 
and um, believe that it would take a long time to get a national democratic revolution and that that would have to be built from scratch. And that's what Rawlings sought to do. But the, the fundamental flaw was that there was no program to do this um, other than some vague initial um, starts of that program in 1982. But then, the, then there were various coup attempts. There, were, there was the belief by Rawlings that certain leftists were out to topple him. And he became much more hesitant about enabling leftist ideologues to take the direction of the revolution in the way that they wanted. Because um, I think he thought his own position was under threat. And I think he thought that the the leftist ide ideological program was impractical. Um, the second question was about the CPP. Yeah, I mean, Rawlings was very um, ambivalent about the CPP. Um, he, like most Ghanaians of his of his era, were you know regarded in Cromwell as a national hero. But I think that um, Rawlings never emphasised Nkrumah in an ideological sense when he was trying to build his popular revolution. Um, I, I'm not quite sure why, other than back in the early 80s, it, it was only 15 years since Nkrumah was toppled. And I think there was still a lot of dissatisfaction with the CPP government era. And I don't think that Nkrumah's national position was anything like as clear and advanced as it is now. You know, the further you get away from events, the more you can look back and see things in a certain way. Um, the link between populism and political violence. Well, the problem I've got with the word populism is really that it, it doesn't mean anything precise. It's a, it's a, it's a label for um, politi politicians, some of whom might be demagogues, who try to see them, set themselves up as the only potential saviour of the people, potential saviour of the nation. And, you know, as you imply in your question, in Rwanda, there was um if you like a populist approach but very much based on um ethnic foundations so it was a kind of a populism but only for some now whether populism led to genocide i i i don't think we can say that really um but it but it, it is problematic the word populism um, and i think we need to use it in terms of a style rather than anything more um, more substantial than that but if it means an appeal to the people and if people can be appealed to to kill each other then yeah they can be a link between populism and genocide final question was about the polarized nature of Ghana's I mean even now where are we where are we 75 years um, 70 years into Ghana's independence um, yeah, the, the, the two traditions, Nkrumah, Busia, Denkwa, are still, to a large extent, significant divisions in Ghana's politics. Um, I'm not sure that anymore they have a much substance, much substantial difference. I mean, if we were to look at the MPP v the NDC, I don't think you could find any, any real distinction between their, their approaches to governing. Um, but I do, yeah, I think, I think the question is right. I think the thing that Rawlings would have, would have felt um, is that neither of those traditions had come up with a, with, with a, with a workable system because but each of them reflected um, such polarisation. You know, you're either an MPP or you're NDC, you can't be both. Um, so I, I think there was a, there was a rejection um, an emphatic rejection. And of course, even now, we wouldn't call, there is nothing like Rawlingsism. There is no, the NDC has moved away from Rawlings. 
Um, there's no there's no party which reflects Rawlings value. Um, in fact, fairly recently, the uh, member of parliament, the, uh, the MPP member of parliament, said the NDC should do more to big up the the legacy of Rawlings. So, yeah, I think he was very critical of both traditions. I don't think he had any ambition to create a new tradition. I mean, one thing about Rawlings is he didn't, he wanted power and he wanted to be in control, but I don't think he ever set himself up as a, as a, as, as the great leader, somebody who, who was irrepra ir ir irreplaceable for Ghana's progress. Um, but yeah, the skepticism about the tradition was certainly there. But thank you for those. Okay, thank you so much, David Ajiman. You 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 raised your point already, did you, or what? What did you raise your you, you raised your point, right? Yes, yes, yes. Perfect. Thank thank you very much. I want to just make sure. Um, uh, I just wanted to make sure that that we got you in there. So for other uh, colleagues, raise your hands because we have a couple questions in the chat. I'm going to raise a question and we want to get some more questions in. Um, so from Nana, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, Nana, I, I, it says Rawlings was thinking ahead of his time when he was thinking of a two-party system in Africa where multi-party system prevails. Two-party system works only in stable democracies and not for fledging dem democratic experimentation. Nigeria is a clear case of where efforts for a two-party system failed and now there was a time, there was a time 91 political parties and now 18. So there were 91 political parties, now they're 18. The question of whether Rawlings was democratic or a dictator to me, he was a benevolent, a benevolent, a benevolent dictator for the fact he could, he could turn Ghana around for good. So this is a comment you may wanna respond to. Another one. According to Donald Rumsfeld, there are known, known and known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And the knowledge of these can either affect a country positively or negatively. Interesting point. Would you say that one of Rawlings' failures was a result of certain unknown unknowns that he was encountered with, which crippled his administration? A clear example, how he wanted to mentor Libya's Gaddafi, but still had to run to the IMF. And I, and I have two questions. Um, you mentioned the his relationship with the left, um, and and for my and again, I'm not a, a, a Rawling scholar, so so if if what I'm asking is um, perhaps um, not relevant, please we would we, I, I'd be grateful for that point. You noted that he had a relationship to the left, but I'm wondering if his relationship to the left, particularly the students and, and other leftist movements, was as cut and dry as him not um, understanding or agreeing with their ideological perspective of, of liberation now, right, or revolution now. Were there some other contradictions, right, that existed um, between Rawlings and these left, um, and these uh, members of the left, many of which who were uh, persecuted and and jailed, right? Um, so there's there's something kind of more to this conversation, which 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 would be interesting um, to to hear. And then the other question is, you mentioned that the PNDC lacked the capacity to create a radical democracy, and, and I would like to hear a bit more about what capacity that they lacked from your perspective. Um, and, 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 and if, if, um, you know, part of the contradiction was, was also part and parcel of the geopolitics of the time, right? So the, here are my two questions. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take Prof, uh, who's going to come on in and, and respond. Uh, we don't see any more hands. If anyone wants to raise hands, please, aha, uh -huh. we'll come back to the next round. Okay, go ahead. Raise your hands for the the last and final rounds. Okay, well, thank you. Um, the, the the first comment about Rawlings being a benevolent dictator. Um, 
you know, I'm always a bit skeptical about this word, this 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 phrase. It's almost an oxymoron, isn't it? A benevolent dictator. Um, certainly, critics say that uh, 300 people were killed during the Pindisi rule um, extra legally, um, with numerous people chased into exile and um, the press muzzled and um, lots going on that wasn't benevolent. So maybe maybe it's a way of saying that Rawlings meant well, um, but he was by no means unwilling to use dramatic tactics like executions to enable his views to prevail. Um, you will you may be aware there are lots of stories, anecdotes mostly, that um, people were killed in Ghana uh, for various reasons over the over the PNDC period of PC, PNDC rule. Um, completely illegally. Whether whether we can um, say that's a fact, but I've certainly heard many stories. I'm sure many many of you have as well. So, dictator, yes, benevolent, maybe. Um, Donald Rumsfeld. This is <laughs> this goes this goes, goes way back to the George W. Bush era, the uh, known unknowns in relation to Iraq, and it's about the notion that governments, it's what governments know, it's what governments no, they don't know, and what governments don't know what they don't know. And I think that you know any any government is always faced with those with those issues because you you cannot know all of reality, you cannot know everything that's going on. Um, the crucial thing is though that you can make decisions to the best of your ability despite those factors. And I you know, from, from, from my part, I believe that Rawlings was quite an effective decision making uh, decision maker in the interests of Ghana. Um, one, one, one way of seeing this lack of ability, and this comes to one of the later questions to some degree, the capacity to build a popular democracy. And uh, um, the question was, what, what capacity was lacking? Um, most popular democracies that build from the grassroots, it occurs by imposition. Um, governments force people to take part. Now, Rawlings never forced people to take part. Um, now, whether that was a weakness or whether that was a strength, I don't know. But I think that Rawlings did the best he could under difficult circumstances, both politically and economically. He lacked the capacity, the PNDC lacked the capacity to put a dream into fulfillment. But if you think about it, most governments lack that capacity to introduce and implement a system from scratch, particularly when power has been achieved via a coup d'etat. Um, so whether this was a failure, failure, whether this was a pragmatic realization that, that things are uh, more difficult than they appear. But I do think that a, a decade of provisional government should have achieved more in terms of building a political structure. And it was only at the very last minute, don't forget, that Rawlings created the NDC and used the defense committees and CDRs as the base and the 31st December Women's Movement as the basis of that party. He had 10 years to do that. Why, why did he wait till the 11th hour? Um, I, there may be one question I've missed. <laughs> then my answer is the ones that I, I recall. So if I missed one, sorry. No, no problem. We had, I think the question was about the left and his relationship ah, to the left. Right, right. Yeah. Right. And, and, and was there a more cankerous relationship yeah, yeah, yeah. you know um yeah, then yeah. this cut and dry well you know i don't really agree with your ideology oh you must you know we we, we must have a more revolutionary approach was there some other was, was it more cankerous was there more yeah. to the story yeah. and then and and how because how do we account for the um um the and for, based on some persons both um, academic and personal uh, experiences, the aggressive approach towards the left, 
right? Yeah. Um, well, you know, so they, so so I'm I'm just wondering how that what what that what that what that looks like. But you can can you hold that question sure, because sure. we got two more questions and then that'll make up make our third question. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so I'm gonna take Achu, Aie, and then Titsi again, and then we'll close the questions out and Prof will do his last round and I'll hand it back to Dr. Emba. Please, I choose the floor is yours. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks, Jeff, for the presentation. Uh, I'm not too sure about the contribution of your paper to the existing literature on Jerry Rollins. Rollins. Uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, between ninth, early, ninth, early 1980s and uh, early 1990s, you are focusing on 10 years on, on that decade. Maybe you should have given a reason why you are focusing on that on that decade. So that's one. The second one, you know, uh, Rawlings's legacy on the economy is still, you know, contested. Uh, yes, he went to the Bretton Woods Institution for a new, new liberal economic package. But as you know, these institutions are not really interested in economic transformation, which has always been the bane of the Ghanaian economy. So all, otherwise, if we have had that economic stability and transformation, we should not be going to the IMF 18 times. And that. So I think that we should contextualize the issues and see how best we can deal with them as they arise. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Perfect, thank you. Titsi, please, your, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned the idea of villainification, making the other a villain um, of the sort of um, opposition. Would you support the idea that populism and its ideologies are actually strongly influenced by psychosocial theory. And here I'm talking about mimetic ideas, sadism to a certain extent, um, basically violence, actual violence being a form of psychosocial um, instead or more than your ide ideology that you proposed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sure, maybe you, you may want to take. I the, muted uh, myself again. <laughs> Please, what, what did you, you say? Start. Um, I'm coming. Please, I'm coming, boss. Sorry. Did Rawlings, um, did Rawlings' anti elitist posture in his region, in his reign, I'm sorry, not region, uh, a keystone reason for his inability to provide the expected economic? Develop, economic development most most Ghanaians at the time were looking for, and then so that's one sort of question, right? Did this this rain sort of impact? Um, did an anti elitist posture, right, uh, negatively impact Rawlings' ability to uh, deliver economically, right, during this period? Sort of what Ghanaians were were hoping for, and then many people concern. Many people are concerned about the situation in Africa um, and Nigeria is an example. Um, and so the question is, Raleigh, the, the, I guess there's a, 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 a belief that Rawlings is, is, is needed in, in many of these countries. The reign that Rawlings um, participated in and, and, and engaged with is needed, needed in some, in some contem contemporary co countries. Please Prof, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> going back to leftist controversy again. Well, um, the certainly they this you know this is a typical academic answer. It's a long story. It's a complicated story. But um, after AFRC period in 1979, Rollins hung out at the University of Ghana a lot, and he began to interact a lot with some of the radical leftists that were primarily undergraduates and some were, were, were members of staff, members of the teaching staff at the University of Ghana. He attended some of the meetings, but he was never a kind of a, he never learnt the Marxist phrase book, so to speak. But he was influenced by the leftists' um, apparent 
capacity to come up with a solution to the to the problems. So when the PNDC came into being in December 31st, some members of the PNDC were directly from that JFM tradition and some were from the NDM tradition, the other leftist group. Um, now, my understanding is that the, the left in general thought that Rawlings could be manipulated, thought that he was pretty naive, not very bright, not ideologically astute. He would grab power and they could then use him for their own ends. Now, that, that might be an, uh, quite an unfair way to put it, but that's, that's, that's one, one hypothesis. Um, Rawlings turned out to be a lot more astute, a lot more ideologically dogmatic than the left were. The left believed in revolution now and ignored the practicalities that Ghana faced at the time. People were hungry, people were lacking employment, people were lacking the means to move around the country because transport was so poor. There were the, the practical problems of living and the JFM said, never mind that, people want a revolution, they'll put up with things. Well, these were undergraduates in the University of Ghana who quite honestly wouldn't have been in a position to know what Ghanaians would put up with or not. And Rawlings believed he did know what Ghanaians would be willing to put up with. He gave the left some time to, to, to come up with an economic plan. After six months, they'd, they'd, they'd done nothing. From mid-82, he was already talking to the IMF, largely because his key advisors were saying, there is no other way to do this. We must have money. We must have dollars. We must have the capacity to buy imports. The country is falling apart. So I think he, in some respects, he used the left as a kind of an ideological platform. But once in power, he very quickly got rid of the left because he believed that they were incapable of coming up with a workable plan. And someone mentioned about the left being locked up. The left weren't locked up. The left went into exile. I, I spoke to most of the key leftists in the 80s in, in London. They were all in London. A few spent some time in jail, but not many. Um, that isn't necessarily because your audience was benevolent, but because he didn't catch them. <laughs> um, I hope, I hope that answers the leftist thing. I mean, it's in the in the book is a whole chapter or two on this. So. Um, yeah, the, the question about why do I look at 82 to 92? Well, this is the period of the PNDC. This is the period that I classify as being characterized by revolutionary populism. So I, I think in a political science approach, that makes perfect sense to look at a period where a certain um, political regime is in place and to explain that and um, that's why. As well as economic transformation, well, you know, the, the IMF especially has an approach to economics, which is there is, there is one orthodoxy, what we call a neoliberal approach. Shrink the state, increase the private sector, allow the state to do what it does well, allow the capitalists to do well what they do. Now that is transformation when it comes to Africa's economies, because most African economies, including Ghana's, were extremely dominated by the state. And what that means, of course, is the famous example where the, the, the tractor department had two tractors and 20 drivers. Now, you know, in, in, in other words, this is, this is, this is a dis disguised form of welfare to give 20 people jobs for driving two tractors. So th this is economic transformation by shrieking the state and by encouraging private entrepreneurs and capitalists to flourish. That is a transformation. It didn't occur in Ghana, not because of the IMF didn't push it, but because Rawlings did not get the confidence of those people until much later. Now in Ghana, there's many of the people or the children of the people that fled in the 80s who are now successful capitalists. Now, whether that's a transformation that Ghanaians think is, is, is a good one, I, I, I question. So there's, there's economic transformation 
forced by the IMF, but it takes two to tango. And if people don't believe that a Rawlings regime would encourage them, they're not going to come back despite the IMF pushing that. Um, I don't know anything about psychosocial theory, I'm afraid. So when it comes to populism and psychosocial theory, um, I would only say that, that populism doesn't have to be violent. It regularly isn't violent. Um, there is no clear link between populism and violence any more than there is between social democracy and violence, I think. But I'm afraid I don't know enough about that to comment, comment further. Um, yeah, Rawlings' anti-elitist position was damaging to Ghana because it meant that experts, professionals, the wealthy wouldn't engage with, the, with, with Ghana until Rawlings was out of the picture, or at least until there was a multi-party democracy in place. So yes, Ghana experienced a decade without some of its best people being involved. And that was due to Rawlings' anti elitist posture. And I think that was a, a mistake, but it was an integral part of his makeup, an integral part of his approach to politics. And you really, you can't get Rawlings without that. And finally, yeah, <laughs> I hear this a lot. And I tell you what, when I was in Ghana till last week, I was saying to people, you know, when I spoke to you in the 80s and the 90s, you were very anti rolling. How do you feel now? And quite a few people were saying, yep, we need another Rollings now. We need another Rollings because the system we have now is not working well. And Rollings brought something which we now lack. And certainly outside Ghana, you also hear this, that, that Rollings is regarded as a figure who, okay, he had his flaws, but he was a figure who managed to change things. And one thing he did manage to change, at least for a while, was the values that Ghanaians believe were important. And so, yeah, I guess it's a question of hindsight. It's a long time ago, he's dead. Uh, but yeah, many people now say that Rawlings on balance was a good thing and we could do with more of him. <laughs> On that note, Prof, I want to thank you um, for that very interesting presentation. I think you um, gave us a lot to think about, particularly those uh, political scientists and historians that do work around Rawlings and around this era. Um, so we're very grateful and um, we look forward to, um, to uh, learning when the book is ready um, so that we can certainly dash out and, and purchase it. Um, because we certainly want to dive more into, into some of these conversations. Okay. So I would like to um, thank you very much. Uh, if we can give our, our presenter, Emeritus Prof. Haynes, a, a virtual clap. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to turn it back over to our, our coordinator, uh, Dr. Chika Mba. Thank you, Dr. Frehiwat. And thank you, Prof. Emeritus um, Jeffrey Haynes. And, um, we want to thank everyone who has created time, made time to join this event. Uh, I saw so many, we saw so many accomplished scholars. Um, maybe it's also because of the pedigree of the presenter today. We have a preponderance of very established scholars uh, at, at this meeting today. Um, uh, we thank you so much for creating the time to join us. And for those of us, for those of you who regularly attend our events, uh, we are grateful. And uh, um, we will come back in the coming week. Um, this time we'll be hosting the third occupant of the Kwame Nkrumah chair in African studies. Uh, it will be a hybrid event here at the Institute of African Studies, Professor Horace Campbell. Uh, Professor Jeffrey uh, Hens, once again, we are grateful that uh, you were able to make this event in spite of the hitches we had uh, at the beginning. Okay, well. Um, as usual, we will just um, stop recording and then... Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm hoping to launch the book in Accra next year, so I hope you'll all come and um, I, I'll, I'll hear 